Kamartaj, Kathmandu, Nepal, August 9, 2012. I had become intimately familiar with way the sound of a graphite pencil tip scraping across a piece of paper echoed off the bare brick walls of my room in Kamartaj, after three weeks of almost constant mundane homework. The frustration I felt with having to relearn things that I had all but forgotten in the years leading up to my death and reincarnation. At least this time around I wasn't constantly forgetting every single mathematical formula at the moment I was no longer using it, which had been a major issue in my past life. And it wasn't just my memory that had been improved by being reborn in my new body either, as I found my overall level of comprehension had vastly improved as well, allowing me to work my way through the schoolwork that the Ancient One had assigned to me at an ever-increasing pace. By this point I had already finished nearly half of the books that she had first handed over, quickly burning my way through all of the math books, before turning my full attention to the now much shorter stack of science books still sitting on the corner of my desk. The reward I received once I had handed those books into the librarian, and he had the chance to grade all of the homework involved, was to be handed even more books, this time on the basics of mechanical and electrical engineering. Which made me realize that the Ancient One probably knew more about what I needed to do in order to prepare myself for the inevitable war against the Reapers than I did myself. I hadn't even imagined being able to use magic to repair broken objects, let alone view their history all the way back to when they were first constructed, before she showed me it was even possible in the first place. Shaking my head, I turned my attention back to the questions listed at the end of the chapter one had just gotten done reading in the electrical engineering book, quickly working the next problem out in my head before picking my pencil up to write the answer down in the cheap spiral notebook that Baron Mordo had chosen to get me when the Ancient One sent him out to get my school supplies. The familiar sound of graphite on paper echoed within the confines of my room once more, before ending with a sharp snap as the tip of the pencil broke off mid ohm Uttering a curse, I resisted the urge to use the repair spell on my pencil, since the last time I made that mistake the spell had grabbed not only the broken tip, but also all of the graphite that had been removed from the pencil before that, erasing all of the homework that I had just completed. Grumbling about cheap-ass sorcerers buying cheap-ass pencils, I quickly located the broken-off piece of graphite so that I could throw it away in the waste basket the servants had thoughtfully provided for me. My scathing diatribe was briefly interrupted by a familiar as snicked as I extended one of my claws so that I could use the adamantium plated edge to sharpen the tip of my pencil, being careful not to remove too much material since I only had a limited number of pencils to use on an ever-growing amount of homework. Though even if I did have the money to buy my own pencils, I would have probably rather spent it on some decent three-hole college rule paper, having grown sick and tired of picking up the loose little bits of paper that inevitably got scattered around the room every time I tore another sheet from the cheap spiral notebooks that Mordo had also chosen to pick up when the Ancient One sent him out to gather my school supplies. I didn't dare use the repair spell on them either, at least not until I got a bit better at separating out the history of that single piece of paper from the rest of the notebook. It was a work in progress, let's put it that way. With my pencil freshly sharpened, I quickly finished writing out the math that I had already completed and memorized inside my head, before tearing the now complete assignment from the spiral notebook with yet another frustrating scattering of torn off binding. Laying the paper down on top of the other assignments that I had completed that morning, I then spent a few moments to tidy up my desk, making sure to get as many of the tiny pieces of paper into the waste basket as possible. I then allowed myself a brief moment to stretch out the kinks in my body, thanking my healing factor for preventing me from getting a cramp after sitting down at my desk for hours on end, before using my hands to brush the wrinkles from my crimson apprentice robes. Grumbling at the inevitable scatter of tiny pieces of paper that followed, I grabbed my latest stack of completed homework and left my room, doing my best to ignore the jealous looks aimed at me by my fellow apprentices as I passed them in the twisting corridors of Kamartaj on my way to the library. It was harder to ignore the whispered conversations that followed, as my heightened senses made it all too easy to hear them complain to each other about all of the time that I was allowed to spend being personally trained by the Ancient One. Which was somewhat ironic, considering that a majority of the time I spent during those private lessons involved her tossing me around the mirror dimension like a rag doll, an experience that would have doubtlessly seen me dead several times over if it hadn't been for my ridiculously powerful healing factor. I doubt there wasn't a single person in Kamartaj who hadn't witnessed me stumbling back to my room in torn and bloody robes at least once since the Ancient One took over my training, so I had to wonder what they thought we were really getting up to in there. I actually hadn't seen much of the Ancient One since she handed me my first stack of school books, since she was apparently quite busy with her duties as the Sorcerer Supreme at the moment. The last lesson she had given me was well over a week ago, where we had sat down over a pot of tea to discuss the nature of the mirror dimension itself, as a prelude to her training me on how to access it on my own so that I could continue my morning training on my own while she was otherwise unavailable. 
being able to gain access to the mirror dimension on my own was all kinds of awesome, even though I was currently only using it to give myself a safe place to practice some of my deadlier combat skills without being witnessed. Having the ability to wander around unseen and undetected like that would be a very useful tool in the future, though the inability to escape without a sling ring did somewhat limit its versatility. Quickly making my way across the lower courtyard I was soon walking through the broad doors of the library. The familiar scent of old books and incense greeted me as I entered, though it was immediately followed by a muted sigh as Master Khan noticed me walk in, which was understandable. The Ancient One had selected the librarian to be the one to grade my homework, on account of his number of years of experience as a substitute teacher before he found his true calling in the mystic arts. Back again, are we? Master Khan asked, setting aside what I recognized as one of the assignments that I had turned in over three days previously. You know, I think I've graded more homework from you in the last three weeks than an entire classroom of children could hand me in a single month. Although I do have to admit that there has been a lot less red ink and teenage drama to deal with. I heard Wong let out a muffled laugh as he continued shelving books near the back of the library, having been brought in to assist the current librarian when so much of his time was currently being spent grading my homework. I've been left with a lot of time to work on my assignments over the last week, I explained, giving an apologetic look as I handed him even more homework to grade. With the ancient one away, there's not much else for me to do at the moment but study. Well then, I have good news for the both of us, Master Khan replied, picking up the stack of ungraded papers so that he could add the new ones to the bottom. The Ancient One visited earlier this morning and asked me to let you know that she will be expecting you. Oh, she did, she's back, that's, thanks. I rambled, immediately feeling energized at the thought of potentially learning something new that didn't come from a book. I'd better. Don't let me hold you here any longer, the librarian told me, waving a pen in my direction as he returned to grading my homework. He didn't need to tell me twice. The Ancient One was sitting behind her desk when I entered the room, calmly sipping a cup of tea while reading a heavy tome, as if she hadn't just spent the last week fighting off an interdimensional incursion. She didn't bother to take her eyes off the page she was on, though her lips did twitch with a suppressed smile as when I sat down in the chair across from her, and I felt the tension that had been building during her absence slowly begin to bleed away. So, Master Khan has told me that you've been keeping him very busy, the Ancient One noted, idly turning a page in her book. I have to wonder if you've had the time to practice the repair spell, on account of all the homework you've been turning in. A little bit, I admitted, shifting uncomfortably in my chair. But my robes haven't been getting damaged as much recently, and there's only so much I can learn from repairing the same broken teacup. I'm glad you've realized that fact on your own, the Ancient One told me, finally closing her book and setting it aside. That is one of the reasons why I had Master Khan supply you with books on mechanical and electrical engineering, as familiarity with both of those subjects will be of great assistance to you during this next exercise. The Ancient One stood up as a pair of servants entered, allowing one of them to remove the tea set that she had been using, while the other gathered the heavy tome she had been reading, returning it to one of the bookshelves that lined the room before following the first servant out of the room. Moments later another servant entered the room carrying a large wooden box, which they placed on the recently cleared desk, before giving the Ancient One a quick bow and leaving the room as well. I've been having the servants set aside a small collection of broken items over the past few weeks, the Ancient One explained once we were alone, opening box so that she could examine its contents, the lid blocking my view. Small things, which would normally be thrown away by their previous owners, which shall suit our own needs quite well. Reaching one of her hands into the box, she soon pulled out an old-fashioned mechanical alarm clock, its broken face revealing a nest of mangled gears and twisted metal. While it isn't necessary to have in-depth knowledge on how a device functions in order to repair it with magic, you will find that the amount of energy required to complete the spell will vary depending on your own familiarity with the object you are trying to fix, she said, closing the wooden box so that she could set the broken alarm clock on top of its lid. Needless to say, this will be a bit more complicated than teacups and robes. However, Master Khan has had nothing but good things to say about your grades, so I'm sure you'll catch on quickly. I'll try my best, I agreed taking a moment to stare down at the exposed gears of the broken clock as I got ready to cast. It only took a moment for the mandala to form around my forearm, what little practice I had managed to squeeze in between long hours of homework having been spent mindlessly recasting the spell in order to shorten its casting time. A few errant sparks still escaped as I increased the flow of energy into my third eye, figuring that fixing the clock had to be at least as complicated as reverting a pile of thread back into a functional set of ropes. 
So why do I have a feeling that this will be a lot more complicated than she's letting on, I thought to myself in the brief moment before the spell connected. Oh, that's why. My world was suddenly filled with a cacophony of moving parts as gears, levers, and springs began to assemble themselves within my mind's eye. I found myself becoming overwhelmed as my mind tried to keep track of each individual moving part, even as I fought to seek out the moment in its history that I needed to focus on in order to complete its repairs. The corners of my vision were beginning to fade to black, and I thought I could hear a voice speaking to me as if from a great distance, before everything suddenly snapped back into focus. Right, Laura? The Ancient One asked, a gentle hand on my upper back. Yeah, just, wow, I muttered, finding myself staring down at the still broken clock as my mind started to interpret what the repair spell was showing me in the context of everything I had been learning about mechanical engineering over the last week. It makes so much sense now, why does it make so much sense? Because you are no longer limited to observing the world through your physical senses, the Ancient One explained. Currently, within your mind's eye, you are viewing everything there is to know about this clock. Every single detail is revealed to you, down to the minute threads of each individual screw, and the exact tension of every spring. Right now, in this moment, you know more about this clock than those who designed it in the first place, and you are intimately aware of every aspect of how it functions. More than that, you currently have access to every single moment in its existence, all the way back to when it was first assembled. If you focus hard enough, you might even begin to gain the same familiarity with its use of those who have handled it before. You, what? I asked, the repairs fell falling apart as turned to look at her in shock. You mean I can learn how to use something, just by channeling the right spell? With time, and practice, the ancient one agreed, before gesturing back at the clock. And, speaking of practice. Yeah, right, okay, I muttered, my mind reeling from this latest revelation as I turned my attention back to the task at hand. Practice, gotcha. My hands were trembling a bit as I formed the mandala, though I had managed to steady them by the time I managed to reconnect with the still broken alarm clock. Thankfully my mind wasn't immediately overwhelmed the second time around, since I had already managed to interpret the information the spell was providing to me using the knowledge that I had gained from my recent book studies. Now that I knew what to expect, I pulled back from the intimate view of the clock's inner workings so that I could view it as a whole, taking a moment to examine how all of the different bent and broken pieces of metal were preventing it from functioning. I then began to slowly look back into its history, watching as the pieces of the clock snapped back into place once, twice, and then a third time, as a series of impacts reversed themselves, ending with the sharp movement of the hammer rattling between the two bells attached to the top, before going back just a bit further to just before its previous owner had set the alarm the night before. Locking that moment of history in place within my mind, I channeled the necessary energy into the physical structure of the clock, watching the cascade of movement as broken bits of metal snapped back into place one after another, until finally the clock face sealed itself over the now properly moving inner workings. Slowly releasing the energy that had been holding the spell in place I couldn't help but feel a real sense of accomplishment as I watched the second hand continue to go about its merry way. Wonderful, the ancient one complimented, picking the now repaired alarm clock up and setting it aside on her desk. I'm sure that Master Wong will appreciate having a working alarm clock again. I somehow doubt that, I thought to myself, considering how it got broken in the first place. But don't worry, she continued, opening the box and reaching in once more. I still have several more broken items for us to practice with. She had me repair a number of small objects over the course of the next few hours, each of which helped expand my understanding of electrical and mechanical engineering well beyond what I could have ever accomplished with bookwork alone. From items as simple as Master Hammer's pocket watch, which only had a broken spring and a crack on its glass face, all the way up to an old battery-powered M-FM radio that had half its internal wires broken, on top of the more obvious damage that had happened to its plastic casing when it had accidentally gotten knocked from the edge of the rooftop courtyard during morning exercise. The final item she gave me to repair was a cell phone charger with a broken cord, which she allowed me to keep on the condition that I return the charger that I had borrowed from one of the servants over three months ago. Once the ancient one dismissed me it only took a few minutes for me to grab the borrowed charger from my room and track down the servant that had lent it to me in the first place, finally locating them in a small tea room close to the library. When I finally got done apologizing to them for holding on to their property for so long the flustered servant confessed that they had entirely forgotten allowing me borrow it in the first place, having assumed that they had lost it instead. As soon as I got back to my room I plugged my new charger into the wall outlet, plugging the other end into the bottom of my phone and checking to make sure the charge indicator was showing on the screen before taking a seat at my desk. 
Looking over at the school books that were still waiting for me, I thought about doing just a little more homework before going to bed, before deciding that it was too late in the evening to get started on another chapter. Turning my attention back to the cell phone in my hand I slowly turned it over until I was looking at the camera mounted on the back, which had gotten broken at some point during my trip to Kamartage. It was actually nothing short of amazing that only the camera had been broken, considering how hard I hit the tarmac when I bailed out of that last wheel well during my final approach to Kathmandu. While I didn't want to risk what was currently my only source of contact with my family, I should have had enough practice with the repair spell by this point to be able to fix something as simple as a broken camera. I was also sure my mother would love to have a better picture of me than the ones they had recovered from the facility, though I would have to be careful to limit any clues that could be used to narrow down my location. Deciding to limit any potential interference with the repair spell, I carefully unplugged my cell phone from its new charger, making sure to move the cord off to the side of the desk. I then pulled up the correct menu to shut the phone off, briefly wondering why just holding down the power button didn't work, before setting it on my desk face down so that the broken camera was visible. It only took a moment for the glowing orange mandala to form around my right arm, the energy of the repair spell instinctively reaching out towards the focus of my attention, only to quickly pull back as I caught myself. Remembering what the Ancient One had told me about her fan being more than a single solid piece of wood, and how each individual slat had its own personal history that could be called upon, I realized that the same could be said for the camera on my cell phone. Since I still wasn't sure if the spell could even recognize the electrons that were currently being used to store all of the phone's data, as the subject hadn't been brought up yet during my training, I would have to be careful to focus the spell upon just the camera itself. Even though my cell phone was vastly more complicated than the woven fabric of my robes, let alone the ancient one's wooden fan, it was still made of a collection of smaller pieces, and I had already learned how to break an object down within my mind's eye in order to choose which of those pieces I wanted to affect. With that in mind, I spent the next half hour slowly examining every single component of the broken camera, painstakingly repairing them one by one, repeatedly experiencing the embarrassing moment when it broke as I smacked into the tarmac. While it was rather humbling to have my own ineptitude repeatedly play itself out inside my head, I couldn't help but feel a sense of accomplishment as I dismissed the repair spell so that I could pick up my now repaired phone. Quickly turning the phone on, I spent a few seconds hunting down the camera app, only to discover that there was an entirely separate camera hidden above the screen when I found myself looking at an image of my own face. Well, shit, I muttered to myself, feeling a bit robbed. Resisting the childlike urge to throw the offending device across the room, I took a moment to inspect my digital reflection, noting how the color of my eyes looked different with the sunlight shining through my window. At least with the front camera working I wouldn't have to worry about having to take a picture of my reflection in the bathroom mirror under the orange glow of a cheap incandescent bulb. Noticing a splash of dark red at the bottom of the image, I was suddenly reminded of the fact that I was still wearing my apprentice robes. Robes which were hand-woven from locally sourced materials, before being dyed this particular shade of crimson using pigments from the common matter plant, which grew in the local area. All of which might be used as clues to narrow down my current location. Thankfully, I never did get rid of the clothes that I had bought on my way through Quebec City, though I hadn't had much opportunity to wear anything other than the underwear due to the rather strict dress code they kept here in Camartage. Which had honestly suited me just fine, since I hadn't had much choice in what I had to wear in this lifetime, and hadn't much cared in the previous one either. Locking the screen and setting the phone back down on my desk, I then stood up and walked over to my dresser, pulling out one of the middle drawers to reveal my small collection of carefully folded tank tops and plaid flannel shirts, which were tucked off to the side of the drawer that held the thinner robes worn during exercise, or when it was particularly hot, which it almost always was this time of year down here in the valley. Looking down at my meager selection, I decided to go for a plain black tank top, ignoring the flannel shirts on account of the fact that it was indeed rather hot, before switching to the next drawer down to grab a pair of my black BBU pants. Removing my robes left me standing in the middle of my room in nothing more than a sports bra and a pair of tight boy shorts as I briefly enjoyed the slight breeze coming in through my window while I folded the robes up and put them away in the open drawer. When I pulled on my pants I couldn't help but notice that they were a bit tighter around the hips than I remembered them being three months ago, though they still fit well enough for the time being. Reminding myself that I was still a growing girl, even if very little of that growth was likely to be vertical at this point, I then put on my tank top and made my way back over to my desk. Picking my cell phone back up and unlocking the screen I took a moment to use the camera to inspect my appearance, noting that my shoulders and upper arms did look more defined than I remember them being in that changing room back in Quebec City. My skin was a few shades darker as well, thanks to the long hours spent under the sun while exercising up on the rooftop courtyard, 
which made me wonder if any of my sisters had managed to get a tan while wandering around the forest that Belle mentioned. Setting that thought aside for now, I carefully positioned myself so that the bare brick wall of my room was directly behind me, in order to limit any other clues that Natasha might be able to gather about where I was. For all I know the bricks themselves might be made from some special mud only found in a certain valley or something crazy like that, but that was better than them getting a view outside the window. I then had quite a bit of fun taking pictures of myself in several different poses, some of them admittedly rather silly, before laying down on my bed so that I could sort through them to find the best ones to send to my family. Going through the gallery, I ended up deleting a number of pictures outright, silently wondering to myself how duck face ever became a thing, before finally selecting a pair of pictures that seemed decent enough. One of the pictures was a simple portrait, where I was facing directly towards the camera with my shoulders squared, with a small smile on my face. The same kind of picture you would see in a school yearbook, or sitting in a frame on a mantel place, which is what I kind of figured it would be used for. The second picture had me flexing one my arms to the camera, showing clearly defined if still growing muscles under tan skin, as I bared my teeth in a huge grin. The light from the window must have caught my face just right in that shot, since it looked like my eyes were sparkling a bit, which only added to the effect. Opening up the mail app on my phone, I typed up a quick email to my mother, attaching both pictures to it before sending it on its way. 2. Sarah Kinney From, Laura Kinney Subject, Pics Hi mom. In case you can't tell from the subject line, or the attachments, I finally got the camera on my phone fixed. As you can see I am happy and healthy, I've been eating well, and getting lots of sun and exercise. I've been getting straight A's on my homework, and they've already moved me from junior to senior high level studies, even though it's been less than a month since they handed me that first stack of school books. I've started to learn about mechanical and electrical engineering as well, which is how I was able to get the camera fixed on my phone. I'd ask to see more pictures of you and my sisters as well, but I know neither of us can risk giving too many clues about where we are with all of the people out there searching for us. As evidenced by the very lovely brick wall I chose to stand in front of when taking those pictures. Please give all of my sisters a huge hug, and let them know that I miss them. Love ya! Laura If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye!